thank you to the uh, the IHL uh, team and board for welcoming me into uh, this company over the last few months. I really feel very privileged to uh, be standing here before you all and uh, having this opportunity to speak. Thank you, obviously, to our shareholders and uh, our keen supporters as well, because this is a, a very privileged position. Um, so, first of all, let me just give a little bit of insight into how the IHL medical program has been going. So, uh, just by way of introduction, uh, for some of you who may not have heard of, heard of me or met me yet, uh, I'm an anaesthetist by background, uh, anaesthesiologist, as it's known in North America. I've, I was one of the early adopters to the medicinal cannabis train. I was the medical director at Can Group when they first launched, and I've been involved with the industry and, and assisted shaping the industry from both a political standpoint and also a medical regulatory framework since the very start. Um, Coincidentally, I'm in the paper today, in the Herald Sun today, uh, with an article, a very strong article, about my stance on vaping. Um, it may or may not be something that everybody agrees with, but uh, uh, hopefully it sets the tone for something that we're going to do. So the, the purpose behind the Incanex medicinal program is to create legitimacy, to create strength, and create some form of patient self-governance around the whole program so that patients feel comfortable knowing that the cannabis products that they will be taking have been safely tested, scientifically validated, and have been approved by medical professionals. So just moving swiftly on, um, as many of you may already know, there are three novel products that we're creating, that we're shaping. The most important one that I'll be discussing in some detail, first of all, today, is the one is a product for traumatic brain injury. <coughs> There's also a very significant product for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, and the third one is a disease called temporomandibular joint dysfunction, known as TMD for short, for obvious reasons. Um, so the whole premise of why I'm involved with IHL and why IHL chose me was to create a pathway where these drugs can be registered and these can be prescribed by a normal doctor in a safe manner. So this supersedes the special access scheme. So for those of you who are familiar with how cannabis products are given today in Australia, they're given under a special carve-out under Australian law where doctors can prescribe non-TGA registered products under the special access scheme where the doctor takes responsibility. And this is basically a loophole in the law that says Australian, law, Australian registered products do not have the capability to, to treat a certain disease. Let's give the doctor some flexibility to use a product at their own discretion to assist their patients while that product is going through the approvals process. But the minute the approval of a, a true medicinal cannabis product has arrived, then the doctor no longer has that flexibility to use a special access scheme for that, for that particular disease. So it does mean that as soon as these products get registered or approved with the TGA, we automatically supersede all the off-label special access scheme prescribing <coughs> and we become, it becomes de rigueur for doctors to pre prescribe the registered product. Um, so, having said that, in the near term, the company is going to be able to generate near term revenue or immediate term revenue through the special access scheme, as Joel kindly mentioned as well. So, um, every team has multiple key members, and we're, we're doing research across multiple different medical areas, so it would be unreasonable for any individual to have that body of knowledge, because it's a profound body of knowledge required. So, I've given a little bit of background about myself. Um, in addition to being an anaesthetist uh, and the chief medical officer here, officer here at Impression Health, I'm also a research fellow at Swinburne University and um, most of the work I do through Swinburne is in the medicinal cannabis space. So we're involved with 12 clinical trials of which I'm a chief investigator or the medical officer associated with it. Um, the second gentleman on the immediate right of me there is Dr. Simon Inkfuss. He's a Melbourne University guy. He's a, a very senior dentist and he's the only dual qualified endodontist and specialist prosthodontist in Australia. So he's got a, a double fellowship and of which he's the only guy. And he's our clinical lead on gingivitis. So essentially his clinical practice is a pure gingivitis and periodontitis practice. So very hyper specialized in that one particular area. And he would see more patients than probably anybody in the state and possibly anybody in Australia in those particular fields. So very well qualified. In addition to that, you'll notice that uh, in Minnesota in the USA, he's in a specific fellowship which has taught him uh, a lot of those skills that he's bringing to Australia today. 
So he'll be the main lead on all our gingivitis trials, and he's been advising us already to this point in terms of the product formulation that we'll be providing to the market. Uh, the third guy is an internationally recognised professor, uh, Professor Michael Stubbs, again based in Melbourne. He's one of two oral medicine specialists Australia-wide. So these guys have got special training where they've done dental training and they've done further postgraduate training in oral medicine. And it's, it's a small specialty, but it's a very unique specialty and it gives them a specific focus. In Michael's case, his, area, his niche area is temporomandibular joint dysfunction and also other rare neurological diseases of the face, including atypical facial, facial pain, burning mouth syndrome. And he's been anecdotally treating many thousands of these patients over the years with a variety of sort of homemade type products because no existing product exists. So he's had to effectively manufacture his own from scratch. So again, a very powerful addition to our team and specifically assisting us with uh, researching one particular area which ha has a massive unmet need in Australia. Uh, Dr. Ron Jitu, he's former head of the Alfred Hospital Neurosurgery Department, a very well uh, credentialed neurosurgeon. And just by way of background, there's only about 40 neurosurgeons in the state, and there may be close to 300 or so Australia wide. So it is a very niche group. He specifically has an interest in traumatic brain injury and has done lots of research under the neurosciences research uh, allocation at the Alfred Hospital. And he's a research fellow at the National Trauma Research Institute with a specific project of traumatic brain injury. So perhaps the most credentialed guy that we could have got for this particular role. Uh, and last, by no means least, on the far right, uh, Dr. David Cunnington, based in Melbourne again. He's one of three sleep physicians Australia-wide who have a pure sleep practice. So many of you may know, sleep physicians tend to be either respiratory physicians or neurologists. He's, he's a pure sleep physician. He's the owner of St. Vincent's Hospital Sleep Lab and a very well published, very well credentialed sleep physician. And he's been uh, doing the majority of the research shaping work on our sleep drug. Uh, and right at the bottom, these uh, people are uh, colleagues of mine that I work with at Swinburne. So Professor Constow is the scientific head of the medicinal cannabis research collaboration. I'm the clinical head of that unit. Uh, his professorship is all about illicit drug research in, in excess of 500 published papers in illicit drugs, possibly the most published guy in Australia in the illicit drug space. He's done work for TAC, Vic Rhodes, in terms of determining what is the safe level of cannabinoids in the bloodstream when being roadside tested. We've, uh, we've jointly done research on propofol testing, uh, what is the maximum safe level that a patient can have and still drive and function safely. Uh, certainly a global expert in all illicit drugs. Dr. Sarah Catchlove, PhD, is uh, our clinical trials coordinator that's employed full-time by us. And Dr. Gal Wong, another full-time employee of the Medicinal Cannabis Research Unit, He's our medical prescriber and also a cannabinoid drug discovery researcher. So these are guys that you will see frequently in the, well, over the next few years as we commercialize these drugs. Um, again, apologies to anybody who's already very familiar with uh, how drug discovery works, but it's a long road, but it's a, it's a road that leads to riches if you do it right. And the long road is essentially front-loaded. So the majority of the difficult work is defining the product and getting that product to what we call the clinic, where it's safe for inhuman testing. So the, the general modus operandi of all pharmaceutical products are, it starts with an idea. You need to do some form of gateway testing, what we call go-no-go -no -go testing. Is it gonna work? Does it do what it says in the box? Is it safe? Is it tolerated? That's your clinical validation study. On completion of that, you can file for a patent saying that, look, we believe that this product will do what it says in the box and will treat this unmet need of which there is no pharmaceutical. That's our plan. And then you formulate the drug to deliver those exact pharmacokinetic variables that you're targeting. You know, for example, your sleep drug, you might want it to be immediate onset, so someone rapidly goes to sleep. Um, and then you may want to have a slow trickle over the next six to eight hours. So it maintains a nice drowsy level, but you want it to wash out very quickly. So in the morning, they're very clear headed and they can go to work. So the formulation is really where it's probably more art than science, but it's probably now where you define the exact product and you start really uh, diving down deep into how you want to deliver the drug. 
And then we typically move into in vitro studies, which are typically test tube or lab-based studies, and we're using a surrogate marker to see how well is this product working? Are we doing the absolute best for our patients by delivering the product in the exact format that gives them the highest output? And then in vivo studies, typically animal studies, uh, commonly rats and mice, uh, does it, says, does it do what it says in the box in rats and mice? You know, are we now very confident that we can start going to in-human testing? And then phase one is a, is a safety tolerability or toxicity testing in humans, usually in healthy volunteers, commonly university students. And phase two is where we do an efficacy testing and dose ramping study, make sure the product works at the doses that we've suggested and well below the toxicity thresholds. And then phase three is a large-scale randomized uh, control trial, randomized control clinical trial, where we're actually testing the product in the target population uh, and we're using it, we're, we're using a comparison against a, a placebo. And then after that, once it's released, you get, you get full marketing approval at that point, and we can then do post-marketing surveillance as it's widely prescribed. So n under normal circumstances, this is a long road. This takes many years. Having said that, with cannabis, because there's a special carve-out for cannabis in Australia, we can accelerate many of these processes and get to inhuman testing very, very quickly. So in theory, we could start prescribing cannabinoids to humans on day one under the special access scheme and start collecting real-world inhuman data very quickly. So we, we discovered that this is something quite exclusive to Australia and it would be hard to replicate this kind of study overseas. So that's why Australia is a very, very attractive place to do this kind of research. And in fact, many Canadian companies are paying Australian research facilities to do, it, to do the studies here because of the, of the reduced paperwork. So just uh, diving down deeper into our actual drugs. So uh, IHL42X, the obstructive sleep apnea drug. As you can see, um, this drug is currently um, under patent submission over the next few weeks and months and we'll be formulating this drug to determine what is the ideal structure of this drug to deliver the effect that we want. And that had those characteristics that I spoke about before. Immediate onset, slow sustained release, rapid offset, clean washout, allows a patient to drive the next day. Uh, the, the TMJ drug, again, being formulated in a, in, a, in a special way. Until the patent's lodged, I'm unable to give too much in the way of detail, but uh, all that will be uh, disclosed over the coming weeks. The traumatic brain injury drug, as you can see from this uh, diagram here, where it's a solid line, the patent's been lodged, and so I can actually go into that in quite a lot of detail, but this is a, a world first, so I'll get onto that, uh, that slide a bit later on. The gingivitis drug, now that's already pre-formulated and it's already in a finished dose form. So that's going to be tested as part of our phase 2A study coming up in patients with severe gingivitis. And uh, I'll get on to talking about that later in the talk as well. Okay, so one question that may arise is why have we picked such a diverse group of drugs? And, um, there's, there's some method to our madness, and I just want to quickly uh, run through this before I dive into uh, the actual drug topics a bit deeper. So generally what we've tried to do is, is pick targets which have no existing drug therapy available, so no existing pharmacotherapy. And the reason for that is we want to be first in class. And part of the reason for that from a scientific angle is it avoids you having to compare a, against an existing drug. So it's much easier to show clinical benefit in a patient compared to placebo, which is sugar pill, versus an existing drug which is already efficacious. So if I was to create a new drug for treating pain, then there are many good painkillers out there. I would need to show that my new drug is clinically significantly better than the existing drug, which is going to be very, very hard to prove. The sample size I would need in my studies would be in the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of patients. So the ability to prove that is very, very challenging. If I'm treating a disease for which there is no medical treatment whatsoever, I'm comparing myself to a placebo. The sample size is small, the, the trials are inexpensive, they can be fast, they can be rapidly accelerated. And commonly there's lots of government schemes, both in America, Europe and, and also in Australia, where they, the government will subsidise or pay your filing fees and accelerate them. So you may have heard of programmes known as orphan or breakthrough programmes or various other priority registrations where the government accelerates your research because they feel it's a massive unmet need. 
Um, next, there's a commercial consideration. We've only picked areas where we feel the value of the therapeutic area is in excess of one billion. And we've picked that threshold because there's got to be a risk return here. Everyone knows drug discovery is risky. Everyone knows that not all drug discovery is successful. But having said that, if the pot of gold at the end is sufficiently valuable, then for a commercial organization like IHL, the risk reward is, is well weighted in its favor to do so. Uh, as mentioned before, one of the additional benefits of targeting a segment which has no existing drug treatments available is that you can actually access public subsidies at the end of the road. If you now say that we've got a drug therapy that improves, um, for example, sleep apnea, there's no existing drug tablets out there for sleep apnea, now patients can have this medication in favour of, say, a CPAP mask. It's likely that various different public health bodies around the world, NHS in the UK, PBS in Australia, may give you a good run when it comes to applying for public subsidies. Next, global export potential. One of the limitations with which, uh, li releasing a drug which is purely under the special access scheme is that's unique to Australia. You can't export that overseas. You can't rely on that. And we're a 25 million population country. The numbers aren't going to be big enough to make it a very, very viable business. Well, if you've got a registered drug, you can operate under the FDA scheme in the US, North America, you can operate under the EMA, the European scheme, and you've got access to you know, hundreds of millions of patients, a much larger patient population, and certainly a much larger revenue potential for your business. Um, most of the drugs that we're targeting will have accelerated commercialization potential, and this will be mainly determined by the, uh, the registration body in the country that we're making the applications for. So as I said, the Euro European uh, Medicines Agency, the EMA, the FDA, the Food and Drug Association of the, uh, of the US, they've all got appropriate acceleration schemes for novel drugs. The next thing, this is probably the most critical statement, if there's probably the one take home message for today, is that we've only picked drugs for which there's already substantial anecdotal evidence available to the public where these drugs are being used by patients themselves for those disease topics. There is already thousands of patients who have TMJ dysfunction who are using cannabinoids just by their own therapy. You know, in, in countries like Canada and the US where you can buy it over the counter, they're already sort of homegrown, doing their homegrown remedies for that, and many of them are reporting good relief. Similarly with sleep apnea, there's a lot of information out there showing that various types of cannabinoids, specifically dronabinol, has been shown to be beneficial for people with sleep apnea. So we're, we're standing on the existing research that has already been done and has been shown beyond all reasonable doubt to be effective and adding to that. So we're, we're making incremental progress. Um, and I think that reduces the risk from our perspective of picking a drug that's going to be efficacious. If we know that there's a body of anecdotal support for it, we can be more confident that there is going to be more support for it as it pushes through the drug pipeline. Um, and the, the rest of the, uh, uh, the drugs that we're researching, um, one of the advantages that we feel is that because we've got access to Australian patients under the special access scheme, there's a variety of things that we can do that can give both patients confidence and also the registration bodies confidence that these are safe. So we can start getting real patients on these products, testing them out, and we can show, look, well, yeah, these are very safe products. Now, summarizing all of that, it's a threefold business model. Uh, there's immediate term revenue, medium term revenue, and then there's pot of gold in the long term. The, the immediate revenue is obviously sales under the special access scheme. We can bring cannabinoids, we can develop cannabinoids, and we can sell them under the special access scheme to earn immediate revenue. Medium term, as we have more sophisticated products and we get further down the, the research pipeline, we can start selling those as well under the special access scheme even though they're more closely defined for specific disorders. And we'd hope that physicians would feel the need to prescribe these over existing uh, general cannabinoid products because they are built for purpose. And then the long-term revenue is once we've got products that are registered with various different government bodies and even funding bodies, then we can start earning much more substantial revenues, uh, hopefully under government subsidy schemes and also as doctors prescribe them. So we feel this is a very risk diversified model it creates short, medium, and long-term revenue potential, and uh, it gives the company a fighting chance to have uh, good income to support the further research activities along the mid and long term. 
So I briefly mentioned this before. So Australia, in my opinion, is probably the best place to do clinical research in cannabinoids because of that special carve out in the law. Uh, in addition, Melbourne specifically has always been punching above its weight in terms of the drug discovery road. We're probably one of the few places in the world that has universities and hospitals co-located where you can use the medical school brains and you can use the patients at the hospitals to work together to do drug research. In addition to that, we've got lots of government subsidies in terms of the R&D rebate, which are probably better than anywhere else in the world in terms of government co-funding of research. With the special access scheme, we can get products to patients immediately and we can start doing inhuman, uh, we get inhuman data reporting from day one. There's no other country in the world where you can capture that. And fourthly, because we don't have a rec a recreational uh, system in Australia at the moment, what it does mean is that our placebos are very easy to find. We can find cannabis naive patients who haven't already tried it recreationally, and that allows our recruitment for our clinical trials to be much easier and much more cost effective. So uh, based on that, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world which is as high a quality venue for doing clinical research into cannabis today. Okay, I'm moving to the, uh, the, the central part of the talk and the actual first drug. So uh, the traumatic brain injury cannabinoid, IHL216A, is of particular importance to me uh, because it's very linked to my background as an anaesthetist. So this is an inhalational drug. It's a mixture of a volatile inhalational anaesthetic agent. It's called methoxyfluorine, which is commonly used and in addition to cannabidiol or CBD, which again has been commonly used. So methoxyfluorine, for those who know, is the green whistle that you get in the ambulance after you have any form of trauma. It's been safely used in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients. And it's actually been off patent for about 50 years. Uh, there's currently an Australian company that is the global owner of a patent based on the delivery device, but the actual drug and the contents itself are, are freely available off patent. Um, uh, IHL owned the patent around the combination of all volatile anaesthetic agents being used in conjunction with cannabidiol. So that's a very powerful space. So just moving on to this, um, the, the novel cannabinoid therapy uh, research is, is all being done at Swinburne, which is the primary cannabis research unit Australia-wide. Traumatic brain injury is a massive disease problem. It's about 10 million deaths and or, and or hospitalization annually. So it's a very, very significant disease. As of today, there is not one approved pharmacological treatment for head injury. And this is very significant for young men who play sports and road traffic, drive, road traffic accidents, motorbike drivers who commonly have significant head injuries uh, on the roadside. Um, Currently, the, the primary treatment if someone has a head injury is surgical decompression. So if you have brain trauma, what typically happens is the surgeon will cut out a section of bone, a craniotomy, and release the pressure around the brain to stop the brain swelling and effectively reducing the ability to perfuse the brain, send blood to the brain. And that's a pretty significant operation which carries significant morbidities associated with it. If there was a pharmacological treatment that could be given immediate after the primary head bump to stop the brain swelling occurring, then that would be you know, something that's a very valuable, uh, mem a val valuable part of a doctor's armory of drugs. So this, this is where IHL 216A is the, is the drug of choice, and this is what we're researching. Now, how does a head injury cause damage to the central nervous system? So very quick summary. There's a primary insult to the head, you know, blunt trauma to the head, road accident, head bang, however it happens. Once that happens, there's bruises, which is known as, the medical word is contusion. There's blood vessel disruption, and there's general blood around the meninges of the brain, which is the, the coating of skin around the brain. That is very irritant on the brain, and that introduces an inflammatory response, and your body tries to send a lot of white cells to heal that. As your white cell response goes up to the brain, uh, the brain continues to increase the amount of inflammation and causes further brain swelling. Now, it's the white cells that arrive and try to fix up all the blood and debris around the brain, and it's the increased pressure of all the new uh, fluid that's arrived there that causes the damage. So it's actually your own body creating damage to its own brain. And it, in the process of trying to heal the uh, what it interprets as foreign material. Now, if we could 
between the time of the primary trauma and when this inflammatory response really kicks off, if we can give an intervention at that point, we can hopefully subside or even prevent that from happening. And that's really where, where this drug is being tested. So um, without going into too much medical mumbo jumbo, it's the purpose is to turn off the inflammatory response, give the brain some neuroprotection, and also reduce the amount of increased pressure or cerebral edema around the, uh, the critical brain tissue. So that's the sequence of events. Initial primary head trauma, you then get disruption of brain tissue, disruption of blood vessels, brain swelling, and diffuse axonal injury. And then it's the disruption of the blood-brain barrier that starts causing major issues where, product, where toxins can now cross straight into the brain. Chemotaxis means attracting white cells and inflammatory mediators to the brain. The raised pressure within the cranium, so the head is a fixed box, and if the pressure increases, the body loses the ability to send blood to the brain because of our bony skull, our bony cranium. And then we also get the symptoms of this diffuse axonal injury, confusion, headache, vomiting, drowsiness, typically after that major head injury. So the idea is the drugs are given somewhere between the primary head injury and before all these events happen, which ideally should be in the first few hours after the primary head injury. So ideally at the, the sports field side, in the emergency department when the patient presents after the head trauma, and we, we can try and obliv obliviate or even remove the, uh, the, the white cell response and inflammatory response happening. So no, believe it or not, physiologically in your body, your body tries to prevent that from happening with endocannabinoids. And endocannabinoids are neuroprotective already. So they've already been shown that um, they will turn off the electrical system in the brain, they will reduce inflammation, and they'll stop further blood vessel damage. The problem is there's just not enough endocannabinoids and the response is too late physiologically. And this is why giving external cannabinoids, whether they're phytocannabinoids and synthetic cannabinoids, if you can give them fast enough, if they can cross into the brain across the blood-brain barrier, you may be able to terminate this inflammatory process which is causing the damage. Now there's been a lot of evidence to support why cannabis may actually be effective for brain injury. So, there was a study, uh, quite an iconic study in 2002, which showed that, uh, showed in mice, that uh, brain ischemia is reduced with mice that have true cannabinoid receptors versus ones who didn't have the cannabinoid receptors. So that was quite interesting. And then that led researchers to move on to a, a proper phase two study, which showed in patients that after severe TBI, that um, if they were treated with a cannabinoid inducer, there was some uh, improved prognosis of survival. And then uh, the third study is probably the most interesting. So this is a huge study that was done, and it was a retrospective analysis of all patients that have presented to trauma units, uh, usually from road accidents, and who, who've been intubated uh, typically after their road accident. And what it showed is those who had a positive urine dipstick for cannabis had an improved survival rate. So this is you know, street cannabis, this wasn't medical cannabis. So everyone started thinking, hang on, so these are guys who are probably aren't healthier than normal people. They just were you know, cannabis smokers recreationally. But after a head injury, they were more likely to survive than those who didn't smoke cannabis, who had a negative cannabis screen. And then that's, that re 2014 was when things really started going. People started triggering, actually, well, maybe there's some science to this. Maybe somehow cannabis is protecting the brain, we just don't know it yet. And then the Israeli Defense Force actually made a very significant step and they made uh, high-dose CBD, low-dose low THC, now the first-line treatment for in-the-field head injuries. And then in 2017, uh, 2017, ASADA, which is the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Agency, they removed the ban on cannabidiol, saying, actually, it's probably a good thing if players are using this, because this will prevent head injuries. And in 2018, WADA, which is the worldwide anti-doping agency, they removed the ban on cannabidiol. And 2019, so now in most competitive martial arts sports, uh, people vape CBD before, after, during, any time they can to prevent head injuries. And that's very, very common to use. So Nate Diaz has got his own brand of CBD. If any of you are familiar with the UFC, uh, Nate Diaz has got his own brand of CBD, which he uses specifically for, uh, for preventing head contusions, head injuries after, after you know, getting beaten up in a ring. And then the UFC is actually commencing their own trial on using plain CBD for the prevention of further head trauma as well. So it's currently very topical. 
we believe we're the first people who've combined a volatile anaesthetic, well, we know we are the first people who've combined a volatile anaesthetic with a cannabinoid to create this novel drug. So how will our drug work? Um, so the current treatment, if someone had a significant head injury, the current treatment is usually you'll go to uh, an emergency department and if that head injury is showing worsening swelling of the brain, what will typically happen is the doctors in the emergency department may give you some drugs to try and reduce further swelling. And if it's very, very critical and they feel that the brain swelling is going to eventually make you lose consciousness or cause permanent damage to the brain, they might actually induce anesthesia. So for significant head injuries, one of the primary treatments is giving an anesthetic agent. And the way I describe that is that basically relaxes your body, it reduces the amount of stress in your body, and it chills out the brain. So it reduces the amount of electrical activity in the brain, reduces the amount of blood flow going up to the brain, causing that brain swelling, and just calms the whole body down and, and stops that secondary injury from happening. So that's already conventional treatment. So when we combine these two items of information, it now seems very obvious that giving a volatile anesthetic in conjunction with cannabidiol is a solution. It's just that no one had proposed it before and delivering those two drugs simultaneously has always been a challenge. So what IHL216A is, is a novel methodology for delivering both of them at the same time. So estimated market size, we think there's 10 million patients globally who are affected by moderate to severe traumatic injury per annum. It's a greater than 1 billion potential market value. It's a prophylactically administered drug, meaning anybody who's had a head injury should be taking it prior to them developing any significant medical symptoms. So the idea is that a, you over-treat the groups. You try and give it to as many people who have had injuries to pre uh, prevent them developing sig significant neurological consequences. There's no FDA or TGA registered drugs for this, so we're hoping that we can get an orphan designation or some kind of fast track or priority licensing from the FDA. And we're aiming to be globally the first line therapy for traumatic brain injury. So that's, I think that's a, a very exciting prospect for us and we're really looking forward to commercializing that. Um, is there any questions about IHL216A? Anybody have any questions about that drug? Uh, just uh, on the method of, uh, so, so... On the... Um, uh, for, for, yep. um, actually being first aid to it, in other words, you see the green whistle with yeah. you know, ambulances and stuff like that, which is a pain relief. Yeah. Are you anticipating that, that this will be done in the same method? Yeah, so, so the green whistle del delivers methoxyfluorine and it delivers it in at the doses that would only be safe for, say, mild analgesia and calmness. It doesn't give it at the same doses that we would want for preventing neuroinflammation. Yeah. So you probably won't be able to achieve enough concentration of it on the existing green whistle. But it's still a very safe and very, you know, it's portable and it can be delivered by non-medicos, non-doctors uh, in the field. So that's one of the advantages of that green whistle. So if you imagine that dialed up a little bit, so we can achieve a higher blood concentration of that same drug, plus taking the CBD at the same time. So cannabidiol is vaped as well. They're both vaped. Uh, both of them are administered through the same route. The difference will be they're used in conjunction in a single formulation. One is delivering, you know, they're both very safe. We, we've seen them both used in humans for many years and millions of humans. Uh, it's the novel solution of delivering them both at the same time and the fact they work synergistically. So one is working more effective than either of them would alone as a combination. So you go to the press side, you expect that Absolutely. The, the, we'd see the main providers of this or the main uh, prescribers of this would be ambulance guys, emergency doctors and sports physicians, you know, at the rugby field, at the football field, those guys. Because there's, you know, as you know, it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of head trauma in young men and schoolboys at, at sports fields. Uh, moving swiftly on to the obstructive sleep apnea drug, IHL42X. Um, I'm only able to deliver a limited amount of information about this as uh, the patent is still under submission. But basically, obstructive sleep apnea is a very common problem. It's the second most diagnosed respiratory problem after asthma. Now, think about the amount of medication that there is to treat asthma. There might be 500 different types of inhalers. There is not one drug today that treats sleep apnea. Um, they say between 9 and 28% of women have apneic events which are treatable 
and they're just having them and no one's doing anything about it. 24 to 26% of men have treatable apneic events every night. And uh, for those who don't know, apnea means stopping breathing. And so this makes it the largest cause of chronic pathology for which no pharmacological treatment exists Australia-wide, in fact, globally. The, uh, the economic impact in Australia, so Deloitte Access Ac Economics were hired by the government to do a study about whether they should do funding, public funding, for CPAP machines. And the answer was basically a, 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 a yes to an extreme. It was so obvious. And the reason was is that uh, obstructive sleep apnea the cost to the Australian population was $21.2 billion per annum. And this was thought to be through increased heart disease, which is coronary artery disease, increased levels of stroke, congestive heart failure, depression, motor vehicle accidents because people are sleepy at the wheel, workplace accidents because they're sleepy at work, and type 2 diabetes. So a massive, massive uh, significant health and work impact. Now the, the only existing treatment that's approved and validated for sleep apnea is the CPAP mask. And anyone who's ever tried it, it's a fairly bulky, cumbersome, and hard to use device. It's very noisy. Um, most patients who have it and use it uh, find it disrupts their life in some way. And a recent paper showed that 50% of people who've been prescribed and have bought a CPAP mask have abandoned it at 12 months. So in terms of compliance, it's terrible. If there was a medication that people told you, this will save your life, this will cure you, this will treat whatever you've got, but you must take it, and 50% of people have abandoned it at 12 months, in my eyes, that medication is a failure. So uh, I think there's, there was a lot of scope for improvement in capturing a market that is currently unmet, uh, un unmet demand here. And uh, there was a survey that showed what were the most common reasons for people abandoning CPAP, and it was noise and discomfort. They're very noisy machines because they're blowing air into a pipe through, which is seated on, which the mask seated on your face. Uh, some people found it very difficult to use it and just didn't like the CPAP machine and they found it very bulky and not portable to travel with. Some people got claustrophobic with it. it it's, not, it's not cheap, it's several thousand dollars to buy these high quality CPAP machines and often their partners or spouses complained that it was too bulky and noisy and disrupted life. So um, I think if we have a drug that shows tremendous efficacy, we've got a good chance of being able to displace the CPAP machine because most people would prefer to take a tablet for medication than to use a CPAP every night. Now the current evidence on cannabinoids in obstructive sleep apnea is very, very strong. So Carly has been the main research global, researcher globally. He's, a, a, he's an American physician. He published a study in Sleep Journal, which is probably the number one sleep medicine journal globally. And it showed that dronabinol reduced the severity of obstructive sleep apnea by 30%. So this is across the board, you know, males, females, thin men, fat men, everyone. It showed that, you know, this is a very, very significant drug. So as doctors, we consider clinically, clinically significant to be 10 to 15%. So 30% is like a wow moment. That's an eye-popping moment. Uh, and this has been further replicated by three other studies and from different populations. One was in Japan. So very different uh, gene pool, very different uh, population habitus and still the same outcome was obtained there. So we think this is a genuine effect of dronabinol. Now, one of the issues of dronabinol is that you're still, it's dronabinol, for those who don't know, is synthetic THC. So one of the issues is you still de develop the same level of mild impairment that you would with THC anyway. And so for those people who have to sleep and then go to work the next day or drive the next day, that's an issue. So the challenge here was to create a drug that gives enough dronabinol to fix their breathing issues, but doesn't give so much that it prevents them from being able to drive or operate and function normally the next day. So uh, our drug IHL42X has been designed in such a way that it achieves both those two goals without compromising the patient. So how do cannabinoids work? Basically, People who suffer with sleep apnea, it's generally divided into central sleep apnea or peripheral. At a very, very simplified level, peripheral sleep apnea is where people typically have a lot of uh, body fat around the neck, and as they lie down in the supine position, as they drop their level of consciousness and fall asleep, the fat around the neck compresses the trachea and the airway tubes, and it makes breathing in and breathing out difficult at night. Central sleep apnea is something wrong with their brain's ability to sense the carbon dioxide. So under normal circumstances, the trigger for me and you breathing is our carbon dioxide level rises, 
the increased CO2 is a stimulus to breathe. We breathe in, we blow off the CO2 by breathing out, our blood, our blood CO2 drops, and then we stop breathing. As it builds up with normal metabolism, the CO2 hits another trigger. We in, inhale again and breathe out again and blow off the CO2, and it's maintained within a very tight frame. So people who've got, sleep, who've got central sleep apnea, their, their brain is, has been designed so it's slightly oversensitive. So they over-breathe and then they under-breathe and they over-breathe and they under-breathe. So by over-breathing, they blow off too much CO2. It puts their body into an apneic phase where they're, they're now not breathing. So they typically pause or have these, um, have these little spells where they're having these apneas. And anybody who's got a partner or a spouse who suffers with sleep apnea will, will physically be able to tell. They stop breathing for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, long periods of time. Sometimes they even go blue around the lips. And then they suddenly <gasps> take a big sustained breath where they're trying to capture it when their body recognizes, okay, we've gone too far. And then they overbreathe again. And so they, they sort of oscillate between this overbreathing and underbreathing and creating apneas and pauses in their breathing. So dronabinol and the cannabinoids work by just resetting the brain so it stops having that overbreathing, underbreathing response. And that's what we call loop gain. And it brings it in so it's the same as normal people physiologically. Uh, but having said that, the challenge was always being able to use dronabinol and also create a safe environment. So we, uh, this is a study that we know the efficacy has been prov proven in other studies. It's, this is really about creating safety and tolerability of a drug that achieves the goal of treating the underlying disease without compromising the patient's safety and tolerability of the drug itself. Uh, we've addressed this, and unfortunately I'm not able to disclose in full detail at the moment what the, the drug structure is, but it's been designed in such a way that it achieves those two overarching goals safely, and we'll be testing that over the next few months and years at uh, the Swinburne Medicinal Cannabis Research Collaboration. So summary, massive unmet need, greater than one billion plus market. Uh, the good points are dronabinol's already been shown to be very effective in treating OSA in multiple studies and across a very heterogeneous population. Japanese people, Australians, Americans, yeah, very different group of people. Uh, the improvements to enhance the clinical performance is underway, that's what we're doing, to improve the clinical output of this drug. And it's been engineered to achieve the same efficacy with lower adverse effects. And having said that, as soon as we've completed the formulation of a product that we feel very comfortable with, and we've lodged a patent fully over that, then we'll be able to start achieving immediate term sales revenue under the special access scheme. Any questions about the sleep apnea drug? Yes? Should this be successful, and we all know it will be, um, what does that do for sleep guarding? Does that make that redundant then? And similar manipulative devices? Yeah, I think what will probably happen is, and this is me crystal balling, I don't know for sure. I think what will happen is most people will always go for the option of the path of least resistance. If there's a tablet form you can take, it's a lot less uh, invasive than a mouth device. But having said that, a mouth device is, is a lot less invasive than a CPAP machine. So I think it'll be, you know, option one, you try this. If, if the drug doesn't fully cure your sleep apnea to a level that you're personally happy with, then you would probably use the sleep guardian in association with the pharmaceutical. I think there'll be three groups of people, those who use the tablet alone, those who use the tablet in conjunction with the sleep guardian, and there might be those group of people who, for whatever reason, those two aren't enough, they move to, sleep, to CPAP. But I think it will definitely cannibalise the, the CPAP market by, by a significant margin, because that's a, I don't know if you've ever seen a CPAP machine, they're very noisy and very hard to use. Yeah. Great, any other questions? Yes. I've got an ex-partner, we're still friends, but uh, he had that problem with the machine and all of that. Right. Um, can he join one of your um, your sort of programs for when you're testing it? Absolutely. Yeah. But we'd be looking for volunteers for the for the clinical trials, so yeah, that would be very useful. Actually, the more the more volunteers we can have. Yeah. So maybe I'll collect your details afterwards, and uh, as soon as we've got further information about the actual product and the testing. Uh, we may not be able to tell if he's recruited into the placebo arm or the actual treatment arm, and he won't be able to know either because it will have to be a blinded trial. So as long as that's okay with him and he's, uh, he's passed the consent process, then you know, we'd love to, uh, to talk further about that. Uh, any further questions about the sleep apnea trial? Are we targeting that same sort of success rate of 30% reduction in LSA? Have we got like, some sort of target? Yeah, so... Um, 
the target would be defined as what would a doctor choose to expose a patient to this medicine? You know, what would be that threshold of improvement that a doctor would want to prescribe it? If it was 2%, me as a clinician, I wouldn't prescribe that for my patient. I wouldn't say take this tablet, which may have side effects for a 2% improvement. I'd probably say the threshold's about 10 to 15%. If I can reduce my patient's apneic score by 10 to 15%, I'd probably say it's worth taking a tablet. So this, that's probably the, the medically significant threshold. Uh, but if it achieves 30%, then that's a breakthrough. That's you know, much more significant. And so far, all the evidence globally has suggested that 30% is the, is the figure that's being received. So it just needs someone to have been able to create this tolerable version of that drug. We know dronabinol works for this. The studies have shown beyond all reasonable doubt that it's a statistically significant uh, outcome. Now it's just uh, more the formulation and engineering of the drug to be as safe. And uh, next I'm going to talk about IHL-493C. So this is for temporomandibular joint dysfunction. Um, many of you may not have heard of this, but believe it or not, it's actually a very, very common disease. Uh, anybody who's a tooth grinder, a bruxa, or who's got significant jaw pain may suffer from this. So basically, the TMJ, TMJ joint, the temporomandibular joint, is the joint that connects the jaw bones to the temporal bones of the skull. Uh, TMD, as I'm going to refer to it from now, because it's a very long word, uh, occurs when there's problems with either the underlying muscles or the bones in the face. The key symptoms are you get pain in the face, jaw, or ear area. Commonly they get headaches, ear aches. Sometimes people get a clicking noise when they move their jaw, and sometimes the jaw gets locked or stuck, and that's a significant problem. And a lot of people have tenderness of the jaw muscles or masseter muscles, and typically swelling of the face as well when that happens. Now, just to give you an idea, it's about 60 to 70% of the population that will have one of those things. And most people actually go unrecognized. And the peak incidence is seen in adults, young adults, 20 to 40 years of age, and it's four times as common in women as men. And no one really knows what the underlying pathology or etiology or why it targets women more than men, but it, it just does. And despite signs of being common to this day, the, remote, the number of people who actually um, who need treatment is between 5 and 12% of the whole population in a developed country. And this is a very interesting stat from the NIH, which is the peak health body in the US, which said that about $4 billion is spent every year on the diagnosis and treatment of this. So this is a massive problem, a massive global problem. Yet to that, today in this market, we do not have a solution that is uh, a pharmacological treatment that we can safely say treats this disease. So Professor Michael Stubbs, who I mentioned at the beginning, is the Australia-wide expert on this, and he treats thousands of patients a year for this. He's having to create his homemade remedies where he's mixing bits of X and Y and Z and he's putting them on patches on patients to try and treat it. Uh, some are successful, some are not. Um, and that's where really the, the drug that we're uh, working with him on creating is going to be effective. So look, the current treatment options are pretty scarce and pretty poor. Uh, so there's no definitive pharmaco pharmacological listed treatment available today. Uh, commonly people use mouth guard, splints, antidepressants, anxiolytics, anything to try and reduce symptoms varying degrees of success. Uh, Professor Michael Stubbs is obviously the Australian expert who's been treating thousands of patients for this form of atypical facial, facial pain for 20 years plus. Uh, it's generally very unsatisfying. A lot of them try to get symptomatic relief without removing the underlying problem. Uh, our patent pending IHL drug will be a novel cannabinoid API and we'll have some novel other excipients associated with it to target the site of pain and symptoms directly. The pathology, as I said, no one really knows. People think that the underlying pathology is some kind of physiological and anatomical process and maybe even a bit of psychological process in there as well. At the moment, most people are just advised, let's find out what the triggers are. Are you grinding at night? Are you stressed about something? Are you is there something else irritating it? And that's the best they get. Typically, patients either have a muscle problem or a bone problem. If it's a muscle problem, it's commonly stiffness of the jaw and they've got very poor mouth opening, sometimes so that they can't even eat food. If it's a bony problem, then they typically have a lot of pain around the bones of the, uh, of the jaw and that can be quite uncomfortable and cause a lot of lost days from work. So why have we decided that cannabinoids would be helpful for this? So first of all, 
you can Google on the internet, there are thousands of patients globally where in countries where cannabinoids can be bought over a counter are using this already. So this is patient-directed, patient-centric remedy. They're already using this. And there's lots of anecdotal case reports of people finding tremendous relief, much better than what they get from their doctors by self-medicating. Having said that, there's a bit of science to it as well. So cannabinoids already are well used for treatment of a lot of muscle spasticity and tendon tightening disorders. So MS, for example, is commonly treated with, with cannabis. Um, a lot of muscle contractures are commonly treated with cannabis. Patients with cerebral palsy are commonly treated with cannabis because cannabis tends to lengthen and stretch and relax all muscles and tendons. And so it does make sense that from an anecdotal physiological perspective, that the patient's jaw would relax and the muscles and tension strain would be reduced. There's also a substantial body of evidence supporting cannabis, in use, cannabis being used for all anti-inflammatory disorders. So for those patients who've got an underlying inflammatory component to their jaw pain, it should be improved by using a cannabinoid product for it. So TMJ dysfunction, essentially, muscle stiffness and spasm of the masseter muscle, which is the big jaw muscles at the side, the tightening of the ligaments, poor mouth opening, and pain on chewing, on chewing or jaw movement or talking. Um, we propose that our drug will, will be able to cause direct muscle relaxation, relaxation of the ligaments of the jaw, increased mouth opening and jaw mobility, and a direct analgesic, which is a pain relieving action on the jawbone muscle and soft tissues. So summary, it's a drug, it's a disease that affects 20% of the adult population, very, very significant disease. Um, it's, there's no current approved pharmacotherapy for it. The amount of money spent, uh, according to the National Institute of Health of the US, uh, currently on treating TMD is $8 billion. Cannabinoids have been shown in animal models and also anecdotally from patients who self-medicate to be successful for treating this. Uh, we have a, a patent pending investigational drug which is going to be uh, treating this disease which contains cannabinoid as the principal active ingredient in combination with other ones. Any questions on IHL 493C? Great, and uh, so moving swiftly on to our, our drug which is being used for um, treatment of periodontitis or gingivitis. And this is a collaboration with a US company called Axin Biotech. Uh, they're a listed company in the US, and we've in-licensed their technology to be used in the Australian population. So IHL actually have first rights of refusal over current and future Axim products for three years up until May 2022. We've got this exclusive license over their mouthwash and toothpaste to be used for treating gingivitis and periodontitis. So there's no current treatment for severe gingivitis or periodontitis at the moment that is a medical treatment. So antibiotics generally don't work. Uh, there's no real pharmacological treatments. The only solution is a deep clean at the dentist. So you go to a, uh, typically a periodont periodontist and they will do a deep clean, which commonly requires sedation, sometimes general anesthesia, where, and then you'll literally have all the spaces in the gums cleaned out and you shave off the top layer of the gums to allow patients to start again. It's a big intervention requiring days off work and uh, bleeding and painkillers to, to treat it. We propose that the, the Axim technologies that we're importing and in licensing here will be able to fix that by giving patients this high concentration cannabidiol solution uh, in both toothpaste and mouthwash format to be able to treat that themselves at home without needing hospital admission. Um, Many of you may have followed uh, recent disclosures actually by a group in Queensland showing that CBD is a potent antibiotic and some people even believe it's a super antibiotic, it can treat superbugs. So based on that theorem alone, there seems to be a lot of validity in using a CBD-based solution to treat dental disease as well. So size of the Australian market, roughly 20% of the Australian population and almost 40% of all people over the age of 55 have moderate to severe periodontitis, a very big problem. CBD is known to be a very potent suppressor of inflammation and um, a trial to examine this compared to placebo is already approved by the Swinburne uh, University MCRC and we're going to be investigating severe grade four periodontitis to see if we can prevent tooth loss, bone damage and also, as many of you know, that dental, dental disease is a precursor to heart disease. Those two are, are inextricably linked. So just 
uh, recapturing everything and returning back to the start. Incanex have got uh, three novel drugs and then an additional fourth drug, which is an in-licensed drug uh, from the US. Um, all three are backed, all three of our novel drugs are backed by key opinion leaders in the Australian medical fraternity. They're people who are well known, well regarded and would not be risking their professional reputation uh, for a drug unless they thought there was some serious wisdom here. Um, the first, sorry, in addition to that, um, Impression Health have already ordered their first batch of cannabinoid oils, and these are going to be distributed um, under the SAS scheme in the next few in the next few weeks. So uh, we think there's lots of uh, lots of promise here with uh, treatment of patients immediately for a variety of different disorders. Any further questions about? Um, any of the products that we've discussed today or any of the other medical aspects of IHL strategies? Yes. Hi. Um, it follows from what you say that it'd be good for arthritis. I've got arthritis in my hips. You're not pursuing that line? Um, well, I guess yes and no. So. Whilst, whilst arthritis is, is something that there's lots and lots of reports of cannabinoids being helpful for, and we know lots of people who've had rheumatoid arthritis that have had improvements with it. And uh, through uh, my other association with Canvalate, uh, we've treated close to 5,000 patients. And of those 5,000 patients, a significant proportion would have had uh, severe arthritis with chronic pain associated with it. And many of them have found relief from cannabis. Having said that, one of the issues with arthritis, there are many, many good drugs which are non-cannabinoids already out. So if you were to do a drug discovery for a drug specifically for that, you would have to outcompete the existing drugs and show in a clinical trial scenario that your new drug is at least 10 to 15, if not 20% better than the existing drugs. And there's already a price barrier set because that drug may now be scaled up to such a population size that it can be produced and sold quite cheaply. So the financial remuneration to the company at the end of the day may not be enough to make it a, a profitable or even viable drug discovery plan. So that's one of the issues. So it's, it's much, much more sensible for novel drug discovery to target segments that already have big unmet needs. So that's why things like chronic pain, uh, inflammatory arthritis, they're already fairly well served by existing drugs. Uh, and and there, has, there, there are some cannabis drugs being discovered for that. It's that you, the type of drug discovery money and patient size and time required is a lot more than what the drugs that we're discovering here. I'm just going to quickly move on to uh, a market value comparison. So this uh, shows Impression Health as compared to some other drug discovery companies globally. Um, so Botanix is an Australian listed company, although the majority of the research they're doing is in the US and Australia. Uh, GW Pharma is an English company, but it's probably the global leader in cannabinoid research. I have a lot of respect for this company and I have a lot of respect for their medical team that are doing their research. Uh, Zynerba is a Canadian listed uh, research company with many novel drugs. Medlab is uh, an Australian listed company who've got two novel products, which are, are novel in the sense that they're, they're not existing listed cannabinoids but there's nothing fundamentally different between what they're doing, between their cannabinoids and, I guess, general cannabis. So they're not, they're not trying to alter the structural formulation of the product in such. Uh, Impression Health have got three novel products, which are novel in the sense that they're entirely different to any other cannabinoids that have been, uh, that have been prepared before, and they're all new, new molecular entities, or NMEs. And just to give you an idea of um, the, the market capitalization of the other companies in comparison to Impression, Botanix, the Australian company, was roughly about 220 million today. Uh, GW Pharma, uh, which is very far ahead of most companies in the world in terms of the globalization and commercialization of, of uh, medical IP, is $3.2 billion. They're, they're NASDAQ listed. Zynerba is $163 million. Medlab in Australia is 95 million and Impression Health most recently was 48 million. So uh, this, this seems to be a little bit of a gap there. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So any further questions and I'll, I'll, I'll swiftly move on. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>